Uh, so hello everybody, uh, my name is Milos. I'm a blockchain protocol engineer at Trapezus. Uh, we're a small blockchain development studio that's based out of Belgrade um, that does this focuses mainly on protocol development. Uh, and today we'd like to share some kind of protocol development trends that we see uh, as crucial in 2022 and going forward. Um, amongst like other things, we're going to cover the state of Ethereum after the merge, what the merge is, what it entails for uh, end users. We're going to touch upon this problem of data availability. What is data availability and how we solve data availability. And finally, we're going to touch upon briefly of how we can supercharge existing zero-knowledge systems using virtual machines. Uh, so starting right off the bat with uh, this first topic, Ethereum after the merge, uh, to really understand what the merge is and why the merge is kind of important, we really need to look at some places where Ethereum came up short. Uh, and coincidentally, the, the first thing that pops to mind is the thing that users feel the most, which is high gas fees. If your network, if your blockchain network is based on a fee model like Ethereum, um, the more users you have using the network, the more congested it is, and the higher gas fees the users have to pay. Um, I don't know if you guys follow this uh, land sale uh, event that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, some data that I dug up was uh, that somebody paid around three thousand dollars for a two hundred and fifty dollar NFT mint. Uh, which, is, which is kind of insane. Um, and when you have networks that are based on this kind of fee model, you essentially, uh, your users are essentially forced uh, to pay these penalties. Uh, you penalize your users for using your network. Um, and mo more, more often than not, these, all, all, all these users that you penalize, they fall back to some existing L2 solutions. Um, and of course, these increased wait times definitely take a hit on user experience. Um, the, the second part that's maybe not as obvious is this uh, concept of power usage. Uh, so Ethereum's proof-of-work mining protocol, uh, it wasn't designed to be very energy efficient from the start. Uh, some data that, that's also present online uh, says that uh, the Ethereum proof-of-work mining protocol consumes around 120 terawatt hours a year uh, just, to, just to function. So just to put it into perspective, that's like uh, six times the, the power usage of Croatia uh, yearly or like uh, the yearly power usage of the Netherlands. Um, and finally, maybe uh, a point that's very not obvious, uh, is this disk space usage. Uh, if you wanted to participate in a blockchain network like Ethereum as a full node uh, and mine transactions and thus increase decentralization, uh, you would really need to sync up to the full blockchain. And up until recently, that included like terabytes of data. Um, if you're wondering like where the huge dip came from, uh, they introduced uh, this kind of pruning mechanism in Geth a few weeks ago, uh, but it's, it's, still lower, it's lower down to like 700 gigabytes, uh, but it's still way too much uh, for you to be able to sync up with the network quickly. Uh, so how can we fix uh, sort of some, some of these downfalls? Um, essentially, uh, we can divide it up into three major improvement areas. Uh, one major improvement area is scalability, uh, increased security, and sustainability. Uh, uh, scalability means that Ethereum should be able to, uh, to handle thousands of transactions at once. Increased security, uh, that basically means that the underlying Ethereum blockchain layer is uh, as secure as possible with the influx of new users to some kind of new attack vectors. And sustainability means that really mining ETH shouldn't be as energy inefficient as it is currently. Um, and the folks over at the Ethereum community, they came up with this um, really great upgrade plan for the near future. Uh, that was for, formerly called ETH uh, 2.0. Uh, and it's really divided up into three parts. So the beacon chain, the merge, and sharding. And we're going to go over into detail on each of these later. Uh, so the beacon chain, it's really the first step towards upgrading Ethereum. Uh, it is a separate proof of stake chain that runs alongside mainnet. Uh, it's currently not capable of handling any kind of transactions or smart contracts. Um, it only really serves as this kind of coordination layer uh, to, to act as a coordination layer for validators and their stakes, and of course to manage uh, this concept that we call shards. Um, looking at, uh, and actually, yeah, it's actually live as of uh, December 1st, uh, 2020, so that's been chugging along uh, for some time now. Uh, the second part that we got to look at is the merge. Uh, the merge is this uh, single event basically where the Ethereum mainnet and the beacon chain that we just mentioned are going to merge into a single chain uh, that is going to continue to be the Ethereum mainnet, and it's, but it's only going to work on proof of stake. Uh, so proof of work will basically be history. Um, and finally, uh, uh, it's over here August of uh, 2022 uh, because it was speculated. Uh, we don't know exactly know when the merge will happen, but it's speculated it will happen in uh, August of 2022. Um, and the final key to this puzzle is sharding. Um, so to really understand the concept of sharding and why sharding is important, we got to take a step back and look at something that's called the scalability trilemma. Uh, the scalability trilemma basically defines 
uh, one way to look at uh, how you can scale existing blockchain networks, uh, where you really got to pick two attributes but only sacrifice one. Uh, scalability. Uh, scalability means that the blockchain, uh, blockchain needs to handle like, a huge number of transactions at once. Security, that's really kind of obvious. Um, you don't want your transactions to be mutable. You don't want anybody to introduce like, faulty transactions into your network. Uh, decentralization is kind of harder to define, uh, but it's basically about this cost of running a full node. And um, the cost of keeping that node, uh, keeping, the cost of basically keeping that node running and uh, providing these uh, blockchain properties that we value where we don't have to rely on some, some kind of centralized services. Uh, this is, for example, how you provide uh, censorship resistance. Um, but this is really not, not that true. Um, we, this concept that you must sacrifice one, uh, it's not very true anymore. Uh, we actually know how to solve this. Um, and uh, the way we solve the scalability trilemma now um, is through this concept, it's called separation of concern. Uh, it's basically you're, you're separating out the consensus and the execution layer. And what does this mean? Um, it means that full nodes really don't need to process every, every single transaction. Um, you want to scale data availability. Uh, we'll talk about data availability soon. And you want to implement these efficient uh, fraud and validity proofs. Okay. So now that we've got that out of the way, uh, just look at sharding. So in computer science, sharding is a very common concept. It's uh, sort of this concept where you take uh, a system and you split it up into smaller subsystems, which are called shards, which have their own execution and data logic, or both. Uh, in terms of blockchains, this means splitting up your blockchain network into separate like mini blockchain networks, um, and each of them having their own kind of execution flow. Uh, but with this additional property, they, they can communicate somehow in uh, in consensus and form consensus, uh, so they're secure by that. Um, and for a very long time, everybody thought that execution sharding was going to be really the next big thing, and this is, this is going to be the way that we're going to scale Ethereum. Um, this is exactly the, like the mini blockchain uh, concept that I mentioned. So you have like mini pockets that are running these execution logic, and somehow they communicate to form consensus. But this has one huge downside. Uh, it loses uh, this comp composability, uh, which uh, developers know and love. Um, and a few years ago, we sort of came up with this concept of data sharding. And the idea behind data sharding is um, that the L1 layer, so Ethereum or any kind of blockchain network, they're only responsible with providing access to data and providing fast access and public access to anybody who needs this data. Um, and on top of these data shards, we can have a concept that's called rollups. And rollups really uh, supercharge the way we think about uh, execution. Um, the key difference between data sharding and execution sharding is that your rollups aren't really constrained to a single shard. Uh, rollups with data sharding uh, can use as little or as many, as many shards as they, as they need for execution, whereas for um, execution sharding, you're really limited to a single shard. OK. Um, and this is all defined as something uh, called the Ethereum's rollup-centric roadmap. And it's very clear. So it defines this concept of base layer concerns in this concept of roll-up concerns. So the base layer should really only be concerned with this problem of data availability, providing decentralization and security. And that's a full stop. Everything else should be provided by the roll-ups. So the roll-up the roll concerns are execution and providing this fast and easy way to do validity in uh, fraud proofs. So what does this mean for you as sort of a DAP builder? Um, really no changes yet. Uh, your apps will still work the same after the merge. Uh, you might need to accommodate your apps after uh, sharding is introduced uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, but it also means that this kind of su uh, speed supercharges on the horizon where uh, the, the, more, the faster the network works, the, the more your users will be happier and the faster your app will actually work. Um, and for you as the end user, what does this mean? Well, your apps are, are still going to work the same, probably. <laughs> uh, you're, you won't see any kind of drastic changes, but you will definitely see an improvement in uh, user experience. Uh, so this kind of world where we don't have to pay $3,000 to actually mint a single NFT. Um, this next topic concerns data availability. Um, but I would just like to mention that even though Ethereum introduces all of these upgrades, um, and they solve these problems that we, that we set out to solve uh, in the beginning, uh, we still live in a layer two world. And we still live in a, in a world where we actually need rollups and we need scaling solutions. Um, and with scaling solutions, you run into these, this whole new vector of problems, and one of them is data availability. Uh, so what is data availability? To understand data availability, you really need to go back to some kind of blockchain basics. 
So any kind of, uh, at least Ethereum-compatible blockchain, um, in any kind of Ethereum-compatible blockchain, your block is made up of basically two parts. So you have a block header and you have a block body. Your block header contains this kind of metadata information, like the parent hash, uh, the block hash. It contains like the state roots, uh, something that, uh, that, is, that is really lightweight on resources. Um, whereas the block body, on the other hand, amongst like other things like tries, they also contain like the central thing, which are blockchain transactions. So this is where like the bulk of the data is. And if we dig like even further into these some kind of semantics of how blockchains work, we'll notice that there are, uh, there's this concept of like like clients and full nodes. So like clients, they really don't validate or process any kind of transaction. Um, they only really download the headers. Um, and they're extremely light on resources because you don't have to pull in all of the block data, like the whole block with the transactions. You can only pull the headers, which are really lightweight, uh, and thus like synchronize uh, very fast. Uh, for full nodes, uh, they actually need to like download and check every single transaction. They need to keep track of like the full blockchain state uh, for validation. And of course, they're definitely more resource intensive. Uh, so we run into this challenge. Uh, how do we make it easier and safe? to verify block data? How do we make it as easy as possible for like clients to download data and be completely sure that the data is valid and that the full node that they're downloading the data from is not somehow spoofing them? Um, well, we, we gotta, really got to go back to this uh, scalability trilemma uh, that we mentioned earlier. Um, and this is where the data availability problem really comes into play, because you cannot scale without access to data. Um, so one obvious solution is how we can tackle, uh, how we can tackle scaling uh, is you can increase uh, the size of blocks. So the bigger your blocks are, the more transactions you can fit in, the more TPS I can have, which means basically uh, infinite dodge. <laughs> uh, but this is actually not very true. Because if you increase the number of transactions your block takes in and the number of transactions you actually need to process and verify, you run into this problem where you really require more powerful hardware to actually process these blocks and to verify these blocks. With more powerful hardware, you decline the number of people that actually run full nodes. So more people are dependent on running light clients. And if more people are running light clients, then you really decrease decentralization. Uh, because you have like a, the majority of users running like clients and the, the very small uh, number of users actually running full nodes and actually adding and validating these transactions. Um, so can we turn to rollups, our kind of savior? Um, so the idea behind rollups is if, you, uh, if we don't need to increase the firepower node, uh, why not just decrease the number of transactions we need to process, right? If we process more transactions, then we don't need you know, the supercomputer of a node to actually do the transactions and to actually verify the data. Um, and the rollups use this, uh, through, use this through a concept called a sequencer, where the sequencer is a machine that uh, sequences these transactions and publishes them on a layer solution. Um, but you run into a problem where now you need to trust the sequencer. And how do you verify that the sequencer was actually honest? How do you verify that uh, the, sequ uh, the sequencer doesn't like, misbehave? Um, so it turns out for optimistic rollups, we do have a solution. Uh, it's in the form of fraud proofs. So when an optimistic rollup submits something to the chain, uh, you have this like grace period where you can say uh, something went wrong, some funny business happened. The, here is a fraud proof that proves that like something something is not right. Um, and really, to compute these rollups, it's uh, you you need access to the actual data that the sequencer used. So for you to be able to construct these rollups, uh, these uh, fraud proofs, sorry, uh, you need access to the same exact data that the sequencer used to actually publish the data. Um, and also, uh, computing these fraud proofs is really not a computational problem. It's a data availability problem. Uh, because you can compute fraud proofs on your phone, uh, but you, all, you, of course, need access to the data. Uh, for ZK rollups, it's sort of a similar story. Uh, we use the validity proof to, see, to keep the ZK rollup sequencers in check. Um, this means that uh, the sequencer, when they submit data, they also must submit a validity proof, which basically guarantees that the execution of these transactions was completely valid. Um, and validity proofs, uh, they don't require data availability per se. Um, but for users to actually interact with a ZK rollup, with a ZK solution, they, they need uh, like the data that the ZK rollup actually uses. So they need also access to this data availability. Um, so here's an idea. Um, if we actually don't need to keep up with rollup, with rollup sequencers, uh, why not just make them more powerful? Like even bigger and bigger and even bigger. Um, 
if we can use this concept of fraud proofs and we can use this concept of validity proofs, why not just make the sequencers like these super powerful machines that are like supercomputers that are like basically processing these transactions very quickly? Um, but you also run into a problem again. Uh, the sequencer is really, it doesn't matter if your sequencer is a supercomputer, it's really bottlenecked by the data availability layer or any kind of data layer that it's using to actually output the data of its execution. And if this data layer is very slow, but your sequencer is very fast, you're not going to get the throughput that you want, and you're not going to achieve the TPS that you want. Um, so how can we really, uh, how, can, how, can we, how can full nodes enforce um, and keep the sequencers in check and make sure that the sequencer actually dumped the data? Um, if you've been uh, paying attention, uh, we didn't really solve the problem of how to keep sequencers in check. Uh, we only solved the problem of how we can uh, verify that the sequencers are correct through validity and fraud proofs. But what if the sequencer just withholds the data? You need the data to be able to calculate these proofs and say, okay, the sequencer misbehaves. Um, so you, either, you can either trust the sequencers or we can all just like, buy supercomputers and like, execute these transactions and, uh, and somehow verify that the sequencer went through the same execution flow. And luckily, um, like a few decades ago, uh, some very smart people came up with this concept of erasure coding. And the idea behind erasure coding is uh, that you can take any kind of data that is n chunks long and just blow it up into two n chunks, uh, such that like you can take any of those n chunks um, and reconstruct like the original data. Cool. Um, so nodes can now really do this process that's called data sampling, where a node requests a piece of the data from the data layer, and it gets a data, a data, uh, it gets a data fragment back. They can request again and again and again, and do this as many times as they want. And by each time requesting this data, they significantly lower their chances of being fooled by, by the sequencer, because the sequencer now just doesn't just need to withhold the data. They need to hold uh, two and, uh, actually over 50% of the erasure coded data uh, that is dumping to the data layer. Um, and how does this really relate to sharding? Well, um, for these, any of these shards to communicate, they really need uh, for cross-communication, so we can keep compatibility, they really need to have like a fast data layer that they can all access and they can all use. So great. Uh, we run into another challenge, which is how do we scale data availability? Um, well, this is something that we've uh, already ran into with the Ethereum-centric roadmap, and the idea is let's just let the supercomputers do this kind of heavy lifting. And what does this mean? Um, if you think of like monolithic blockchains in general, um, if you think of this very ge generalized approach, um, they're usually made up of uh, different layers. And the, one of the most important layers, of course, is like the execution layer, you have the consensus layer, and you have like the data availability layer. Um, and we already noted that the rollups are going to solve our execution layer, but what about like the bottom two layers that we can separate out? Um, well, there is a growing trend in, in the past few years uh, of these like modular blockchains. So a modular blockchain is essentially um, a plot project like Celestia or Polygon Avail uh, that are transforming uh, the data availability landscape where these uh, projects are only concerned with the bottom two layers. They're not concerned with execution. So the supercomputers and the rollups can focus on execution. Celestia and Polygon Avail can only focus on consensus and data availability of any kind of arbitrary data. It doesn't even have to be a strictly blockchain data. Cool. So we, we've noted how we can uh, use data, availab data availability and this problem of how we can solve data availability. Um, what, about, uh, what about this topic of supercharging zero knowledge with virtual machines? And how can we improve on, uh, how can we improve on the concept of uh, ZK rollups? Uh, so if you think about it, like, there are essentially two types of ZK rollups. You have a specialized rollup that we use for like, payments, exchanges, and NFTs. Um, and you have this like, general purpose uh, ZK rollup, um, which, where you can write arbitrary smart contracts. Um, and the, the key takeaway here is for general, general purpose uh, ZK rollups, uh, you really require a zero-knowledge virtual machine. Uh, so what the hell is a zero-knowledge virtual machine? Uh, this, again, like a generalized version of how like a regular virtual machine runs is you have sort of this kind of input state, you have uh, some kind of program data, and then you push it through uh, to the virtual machine. The virtual machine does like some kind of processing, and it spits out like a final state, uh, usually like a modified version of the state. Um, 
for a zero knowledge virtual machine, um, the story is very similar. But in addition to this like, final state that your, zero, uh, that your virtual machine outputs, it also outputs a proof of execution. Um, and the handy thing about this proof is that it's actually very easy to verify. It's actually exponentially uh, faster to verify this proof than it is to actually execute all of, these, uh, all of this program data. Um, and in addition to like, the initial state in programs, uh, program data, you also have this uh, concept of witness, um, which only needs to be like, known to the prover. You can really discard it after, um, after execution. Cool. Uh, so what kind of zero-knowledge virtual machines can we build? Well, we can base our zero-knowledge virtual machine on like, a mainstream framework, like RISC or WASM. Uh, we can build an EVM equivalent virtual machine that's capable of interpreting EVM bytecode on a binary level, or we can do something that is ZK optimized. So something that entails adding a completely new instruction set that is optimized for this ZK concept. Um, and for each of these, we really got to look at the properties. So is there enough tooling? Is there enough expertise for this in the industry? For mainstream architectures, obviously there is a lot of tooling, there is a lot of expertise. Um, on the EVM side, the, the, the situation is kind of fun here. Uh, but for zero knowledge uh, virtual machines, we really notice this uh, kind of void where there is essentially no tooling and there is essentially uh, really no expertise for building zero knowledge virtual machines. Um, we got to look at if the, if the architectures are blockchain focused from the start. So obviously, like mainstream architectures are not built with blockchain in mind. Uh, something that is easy, EVM equivalent and ZK optimized are definitely tailored more towards the blockchain context and how we can utilize some, uh, some special properties to make sure that our, our blockchains are running smoothly. Uh, and finally, we've got to look at, are these even performant? Well, for mainstream architectures, maybe. Uh, it's debatable. Uh, for uh, EVM equivalent blockchains, um, we, can definitely, we can definitely conclude that uh, EVM-based virtual machines are not as performant as they should be. Uh, but for something that is ZK optimized that you're building from the ground up, you can build it with speed in mind uh, from the ground up. Um, and we mentioned this term of Ethereum compatibility. And what is, what is Ethereum compatibility really? Um, if you look at it basically on a scale where your left bound is sort of this high compatibility and your right bound is sort of this very lower compatibility, mo uh, the highest compatibility you can really achieve is that you can base uh, your virtual machine to be completely um, EVM-based, meaning that you can interpret bytecode on a binary level. Uh, some kind of middle ground would be, okay, uh, my virtual machine is going to be EVM-tailored, but I'm also going to add some new features, or I'm going to add some like uh, add additional instruction sets. Um, and sort of the lowest possible uh, compatibility you can have is you can completely tailor your your virtual machine, zero-knowledge virtual machine, to be not not at all EVM-optimized. Uh, so what does this mean? Basically, uh, highly optimized uh, virtual machines. Uh, for highly optimized virtual machines that are capable of, of executing EVM bytecode just out of the box, this means really no kind of migration that's needed for existing apps. So any kind of Solidity project that you wrote, you can compile it to bytecode, you can give it to this virtual machine, and the virtual machine will run it. Uh, there is no kind of extra step that you really need to do. Uh, for some of this lower compatibility, you fall into this cycle where you really need to recompile the Solidity code uh, for, for the virtual machine to understand it. Cool. Uh, so pros of non-equivalence. Why, why would we even care about Ethereum compatibility? Well, if we don't need to keep Ethereum compatibility, we can focus on one of, one of the key aspects, which is performance, where you can uh, design this instruction set to be as optimized as possible for the ZK context. Um, you can have some advanced features like account abstractions or post quantum cryptography, which are debatable if they're ever going to make it to the EVM. Um, you're not going to have uh, some of these unsafe features that the EVM already has and will probably never remove. Um, and one of the most important things like, uh, in the past few years has been like this privacy-centered focus where if I can make a virtual machine uh, for the ZK context, why not make it privacy-first oriented? Why not have private transactions or private smart contracts? Um, the cons of uh, not having this kind of compatibility is, of course, you need to do this additional step of DAP migration. So some kind of EVM inline assembly, uh, if you use it, uh, may not work anymore. Your VM may be based on a completely different fee model than what is currently uh, in use in the EVM. Um, and one of the, one of the, like, the huge uh, pain points is you really don't have any kind of tooling. Uh, so you would need to provide tooling. You would need to develop tooling uh, to support this kind of development lifecycle out of the box. 
Um, and really, the ZK landscape today is kind of, uh, ZK VM landscape today is kind of more diverse than ever. Um, but it didn't start out like a few years ago. It started back in 2013 when Eli Ben Sason um, introduced Tiny RAM to the world. Um, and we saw, we saw uses of um, zero knowledge with projects like Hawk, where you can write a private smart contract and let like, the Hawk compiler like, do the rest. Uh, we also saw the usage of ZK VMs in projects like Alio uh, in 2019. Um, and most recently, uh, what's, what, is, what is most interesting is that, Ky uh, that uh, Sarkware released Cairo uh, back in 2020, uh, which sort of paved the way for zero-knowledge virtual machines that we know today. Um, around the same time, the Matter Labs crew uh, started working on their, their roll-up called ZK Sync, which incorporates uh, the ZK EVM. Um, and more recently, we saw uh, a jump in these projects by Polygon, so Polygon, like Polygon Hermes or Polygon Maiden. I'd just like to take like, a uh, moment to speak about like, Polygon Maiden. Uh, it is a um, Turing-complete uh, Stark-based uh, EVM-compatible uh, virtual machine. Uh, it's actually a roll-up. It uses uh, a, v a VM. The VM is uh, all of those mouthful of words that I just mentioned. Uh, but it, it is a really good example of how you can achieve EVM compatibility while also providing some uh, features like a privacy out of the box and the ability to use this kind of language flexibility when you're writing smart contracts. Um, so how important is this really? Um, native zero-knowledge virtual machines. You can have some kind of faster proof generation time. Um, one of the key, key points here is that you can have this kind of uh, language uh, flexibility, meaning you don't really have to write your smart contracts in Solidity anymore. Uh, you can write it in some kind of uh, arbitrary language and have it compile and work. Um, and really, it is one of the keys to scaling uh, ZK rollups and how we think of uh, this glass ceiling for ZK rollups. So if there is like anything I want you to take away from this whole presentation is that this kind of future of blockchain uh, in Ethereum in general that we're looking at is definitely going to be modular. It's definitely going to be data-oriented, and it's definitely going to be speed-driven. Um, and that is all for my presentation. Thank you. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. Hold on, what? can you? <laughs> we got prizes for people who ask questions. Here you go. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? <laughs> um, I just wanted to check if I understood one thing right, because I had actually written down a note where you said um, we were talking about the sequencers. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a note for myself, couldn't you just have mirrored sequencers and use the second mirror as a comparison to verify it so you wouldn't have to have complete trust in the sequencer? And then a bit later, you mentioned the ZK uh, verify part mm -hmm. that didn't have to save stuff. Was that actually what I was thinking? Or um, is that something completely different? And mm -hmm. if it's not the same, why wouldn't you just mirror the sequencers instead of throwing more money at making it bigger, 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 as you said. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but I'll, I'll try to, try to like answer it. Um, the idea behind scaling sequencers is that you really hit a ceiling at one point. Like, you can, you can make them very powerful machines. For some real roll-ups, they're insanely powerful. But you can't, you can't scale any kind of roll-up without scaling where your data is actually going. Um, for zero-knowledge virtual machines, um, in terms of like, uh, in terms of like, that's that's that uh, that like uh, concept of data availability, um, they're related. But your zk VMs are not solving the problem of the data availability. They're solving uh, a completely different problem, um, which is actually uh, most mostly it's focused on this kind of language flexibility and having like these new features uh, for for uh, and having this compatibility with existing EVM systems. Uh, but you tailor it for uh, for the zero knowledge concept. So, like the problem with, as I mentioned, like for with, with scaling sequencers, is even though they're more more powerful machines, you really need to look at where you're actually dumping this data. And this is not just like for sequencers. This is for any kind of system that tries to scale. Like you always have like one single bottleneck in a system. Um, and for sequencers, for roll up like existing roll up solutions, that is like the data layer. If that is Ethereum, or if that is like some kind of DB or if that is even like some kind of centralized service, you're really, your sequencer is really limited by like, the, by like the speed of that service you're dumping the data on. Did I, did I answer the question? Almost. 
So um, should I see that then as the, you could technically speaking mirror the sequencer so you don't have to have blind trust and just the fact that there's one there, but it's a little bit like when internet bandwidth wasn't fast enough, you simply can't put it on the data stream that it's going to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so we already know how to verify sequencers. Uh, the, the, you, you can generate like any kind of fraud or validity proofs depending on what kind of roll-up you use. Um, verifying them is not the problem. The problem is for you to be able to verify them, you need to have access to the same data that they used. Um, for, it, it's not very true for validity proofs, but for fraud, fraud proofs, that is definitely true. Like you need like the exact same data that the sequencer used to be able to construct a fraud proof and say, well, what you submitted to the chain or to some kind of data layer doesn't matter. Um, it's not the same as what I computed. And computing them is really like the easy part. Uh, so we know, we know how to keep them in check. We just don't know how to prevent them from fooling us because the sequencer can always withhold this data. Right. They can say, they can withhold like the full data or they can withhold a part of the data um, and you're really just stuck um, blindly trusting the sequencers or just like doing the computations yourself. But then I still don't understand why you couldn't put in different sequencers that kind of cross-check each other. Uh -huh, why you can't put different sequencers that cross-check each other? Um, hmm. I'm not, uh, hmm. So you can have a sequencer that cross-checks like a different sequencer that it's running, right. But yeah, you run into a problem where you're, uh, who, who's gonna like cross-check the other sequencer? Where, how, far, how far does your trust go? Like you can have a sequencer that's executing transactions, you, uh, the sequencing transactions, you can have another sequencer that's like executing in parallel, and you can have like a different one that's fact-checking like the other two, but you're just like stuck with this, you know, scaling and what, what is even the point of having a sequencer in the first place if you're just gonna have like a parallel machine that's executing it as yeah, well? I kind of look at it because I have a hardware background, so from security, the, the first question you have in security is like how, what's your budget? Because mm -hmm. security is endless, right? You can throw an endless amount of money at, at mm -hmm. security. And then I was thinking like, okay, well, you have two different site locations. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, if having just one sequencer is a single potential big problem, why not just split it out or like quadruple it or? Yeah, but you're mitigating the problem. You're, you're, you're mitigating the problem into like another problem. Because if you, if you fact check the sequencer, you mitigate the problem of fact checking the fact checker. You need, you need to have sort of this sure, sure proof way and what's most importantly, like a fast and easy way to actually verify it. I, I hope I'm answering the question. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, we can talk like after, after the presentation. Does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> Hold on. Can anybody pass this along too? <laughs> Here, yeah. just, just as a follow up and Robert. maybe also, oh, sorry. sorry. Just like as a follow-up to that and maybe to clear out. Um, so I think that's, we can go through an example where I give one transaction to, where I sign a transaction and give to a sequencer. Mm -hmm. And then the sequencer publishes the fraud proof, but then throws out the transaction. Right, that's, that's what we are talking about when, with the data availability. Yeah, so the sequencer doesn't actually submit a fraud proof. The sequencer just pushes the data onto like an underlying layer. Um, you're the one that's pushing the, the fraud proof. So you need to re run the same transactions and say, okay, these, you know, the, the state that the sequencer pushed is not the same state or the same state transitions that I did. Um, and that's, that's how you, you keep it in check. So if, if you, if, that's why you have like a grace period for optimistic rollups. Like it's usually, I think, a week or like a few weeks, depending on like what kind of solution you're using, um, where you, we can actually just like say, okay, this was completely faulty, or this was like completely misaligned with any kind of state changes that I can do. Uh, let us revert everything that's, that came before this point, right? Oh, sorry, after this point. Is there any more question? Zdravo, Miloše. I'm taking reference to the remark where you said that we'll get better exper user experience and more decentralization with ETH 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe, um, what's your opinion on, I feel like that often these protocol upgrades only take into account technical aspects mm -hmm. and for instance result in a minimum staking requirement of 32 ETH 
for instance, which will exclude majority of normal users, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are then forced to use services like Lido, etc. So can you maybe, um, what's your opinion if you think also other aspects should be taken into consideration? Yeah, uh, I think like the, the only uh, the only solace like you could find in sort of this this whole path of Ethereum scaling is you're they're not supposed to like solve every problem, uh, you know like they're they're supposed to solve the problems that we mentioned like keep it more secure, keep it more decentralized, um, increase the throughput definitely, uh, but like sort of the pattern that we saw for like the past few years is that these scaling solutions are here to stay. Like nobody, n no upgrade that you can add to Ethereum is actually going to kill off the scaling solutions that we have now. Because the scaling solutions need to work in tandem with Ethereum. The 32 ETH that you need to, uh, that you need to stake to become a validator of, of a single shard, uh, that's kind of steep. Um, but I feel like they, they're, they're still like figuring out most of it, right? Because we, we, for now, like we don't have a concrete date of the merge. Like we have no idea when sharding will be introduced. You know, if you ask anybody in the Ethereum community that's, that's working on this, um, everything is sort of ETA, you know. Um, but we got to work with like the systems that we have now. And right now we have the Ethereum as, as it's functioning with up the upgrades that are coming soon. But we also have we also have sorry rollups to use uh, and different like scaling solutions to use as well. Um, so yeah, um, it, it it just depends on like um, how you're looking at it from from a user standpoint. The user is not gonna is not really gonna care if, you know, uh, his transaction or their transaction like went through, like 50 different scaling solutions to actually be be executed, uh, as long as it's like very very snappy and very fast, uh, and it pertains to like some some of these properties that they care about like security or decentralization, you know, or even if they don't care about that, you know, they just care about like the user experience that they want. We don't have any time for questions. <laughs> okay. Okay.